Uh, as Connie mentioned, if you weren't here last week, the folks were here from Eastern Appalachian Teen Challenge. Uh, the girls shared testimony as to what that organization is doing uh, in them and the glory that it's bringing to God and the transformation of new life. Now, uh, they are a nonprofit. They do not receive funds from anything other than what they raise. So in addition to funds that they are looking for, there's a list of basic needs. And these are things that you could pick up for your own home and your own personal needs. Uh, if you want to be a part of that and you want to help uh, there will be times when we'll be making trips up there so we can gather stuff for them if you feel so led. There's a list on the table uh, as you enter as well. And as Connie said, they are uh, part of our special contribution today, but the steering committee would like you to consider, right, because we're not, we're not uh, called to give out of compulsion, but we are to, to be praying about what we are to do with our resources. The steering committee would like you to consider what it would look like if we added them to our monthly contribution uh, as far as uh, a, a mission. Uh, missions don't just take place overseas, but they take place right here in our backyard. And if you would prayerfully consider uh, and reach out to the steering committee, yay or nay, if you want this to be an ongoing thing, we would appreciate that. Uh, lastly, if you joined us on Wednesday night, um, there were 30 people here on Wednesday night. It was so cool. Um, let's do it again. So this coming Wednesday, we're going to continue this week. We're going to be looking at Psalm 1. I would love if you would join us. I would love if you'd read it, pray through it, come to the table with what you feel the Lord is speaking to you in that. This will be less of a technical study and more so of a... Uh, of a study based on worship and, and devotion. So uh, please read Psalm 1. Is it Psalm or We're reading Psalm 1. So very interesting. Thank you, Irma. Just as Proverbs is arranged poetically, a lot of poetry that we see as blatant poetry in the Bible, like Psalm 1, is, are didactic poems. And uh, therefore, they are poems that are created for the purpose of teaching. So we can learn a lot from Psalm 1. So I hope that you can join us. We start eating around 6, uh, grilling some burgers and dogs and some sausage. Maybe we'll find a chicken wing one of these wing weeks coming forward too. Those are always fun. Um, and then we dive into the Word at 7 with the intention to get us out by 8 o'clock. And lastly, before we go to prayer, happy Father's Day to all the dads there. Um, Alyssa is going to be handing out with mom uh, a treat for the dads out there. And I just want to take a minute to reflect on dads. Uh, so if you guys want to hand the stuff out as we're reflecting on dads, it is typical of God that God gives us exhortations. We'll see every time God speaks and enters into covenant uh, with folks, God pronounces his name. Then God gives an exhortation. As, as, and as we fulfill God's exhortation, we then see the blessing that comes along with it. There are so many exhortations in scripture to fathers, how we are to act, how we are to pour into our children, how we are not to provoke our children. It is a task. The idea of the dad that just comes home and sits on the sofa and has the kids wait on him, that is not a thing. We are to serve our family. We have dominion over our household, and that is not the blessing. That is the charge. But here is the blessing in Psalm 127. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior or a children of one's youth, bless Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. The idea that we men are blessed with the abundance of life that's in our home, with the life and the youth that is around us, and the abundance can come with one child, one little voice. And if you've ever had hands wrap around your neck and say, I love you, Daddy, 
you have experienced the blessing that God promises in that psalm. So, as we go into our prayer this morning, I want to start. We're praying for all the dads that are in the room, all the dads that are watching online, and all the dads that can't be here today. And then we'll pray for the opening of our service. Heavenly Father, what a great and gracious gift you have given us with your Son. Your name is mighty. Your name is one of reverence. And Lord God, that we call you Father, you have given us the perfect example of what it is to be a father. Though you correct, there is grace. Though you guide us, there is love. Lord God, please equip us. Please equip each and every man in this building that's watching online that will see this in its perpetuity, Lord God, uh, including myself, that you would equip us for the task and the role, the exhortation that you have given us to be godly men that would lead our family, that would be perfect examples of the love that you have given us, Lord God. May each and every one of our children be known as your children, before they're even known as our children. Lord God, as I know as a dad, if there's one, one prayer that's constantly on my lips is that my children know you, and Lord God, that you know them. Lord God, please continue to mold me into your image that I could be a dad worthy of the love that our children give us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So happy Father's Day, everybody. So today without the monitors, it's an unfortunate day to be without the monitors because we're going to be kind of all over the place. Uh, we'll be reading today from John, continuing on John chapter 8. Last week we touched on verse 12, but we're going to continue uh, John chapter 8, looking at verses 12 through 20 this week. And God's word says, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about your testimony, and your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear test, uh, witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Can we pray one more time before getting into God's word? Dear Lord God, give us clarity to see your face just for a moment, that we can commune with you this morning, Lord God. Let us get a truer understanding of your love and your will for each and every one of our lives. Lord God, please empty me of these next moments. Use me as a conduit for your word. Let me serve these people in just speaking of you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So this morning, I'd like to start and look at this scripture through the lens of Genesis 22. Now in Genesis 22, and just kind of leading us up to that point, uh, we see the calling of Abraham. And God calls Abraham out of his home. Abraham is a very wealthy man, but Abraham is missing one thing that is very valuable to him, and that is an heir. But God promises him an heir, and not only an heir to his family and his, his line, but that his line would actually lead to a multitude of nations. We see as we travel through the Abraham narrative 
that God protects Abraham and Sarah, that God leads Abraham and Sarah, that, that God's promise should be something that is easily believed regardless of the advanced age of Abraham and Sarah. In no way did, did God give any room to doubt that he would fulfill what he had promised Abraham, which would be that he would be the father of many nations. But we see that Abraham struggles with his faith. He feels as though he needs to get his hands dirty in order to enable God's will to be done. So what does he do? He takes the servant and he sires a child with her. Well, we know that this was not the lineage that God was talking about. It was part of the lineage. It was part of the multitude of nations. But at one point, Ishmael is sent off. It was the child that would be through the promise that God was, was promising Abraham. So he then fulfills the promise. He gives him Isaac. But here's the thing. When faith becomes sight, it's, it's very easy to believe. But for somebody that God would place as the patriarch of his chosen people, the faith needed to be solid. It needed to be unshakable. And regardless of what we look at Abraham and we say, okay, there is no doubt, as Scripture says, that, that his faith has counted him as righteousness, there was still a molding that needed to be done. There was a pouring into Abraham, and it was by trial that it would need to be done. And that trial was God calling Abraham to take Isaac up into the mountain and to offer him as a sacrifice unto the Lord. The pain and anguish that Abraham would be going through as he was holding on to his most treasured possession. It's one thing, and on Father's Day, it's appropriate that we think about uh, the struggle that must have been going on inside of Abraham. But do we believe enough in God even for that with which we treasure so much? What does this faith look like? So, of course, we know the end of the story that God provides a sacrifice. We see the ram in the thicket. And then he reiterates his promise to Abraham. And in, in uh, Genesis 22, verse 16, he said, And by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offsprings of the stars in the heaven and the sand. Now think about that statement. Why does the Lord need to swear by himself? Is his word not enough? Hebrews 6.13 says that God swore by his own name because there is no other name higher that he could swear by. The efficacy of God's word is what we rest all of our hope in. This is where our faith needs to be. Every aspect of our life, of our life, not doubting anything that regardless of circumstance, regardless of outcome, we understand that it is God's will and we are going to trust in that. Otherwise, how can we trust the promise? Because the promises, we're going to even get more far out. We read in Isaiah, God promises, he says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? What could that be? So much so that in 1 Corinthians, when Paul quotes Scripture, he says, What no eye has seen, seen nor ear has heard, nor heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So many times people fall so short of their belief in God and the understanding that he is actually doing a new thing, that we monetize Scripture like that, that we give value and, and earthly proportion to something that is beyond value. Redemption of God through Christ Jesus. It is the doubting of our flesh that reduces the promise of God to something tangible. Because what he is promising is something beyond belief. The idea that we could have peace with God, that we could have reconciliation with God. 
that we could be back in relationship with God. So we doubt him. We doubt him over and over again. And that's what we're seeing in the scripture. We see the purpose for this. As Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3.19, Jesus explains to him, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Their mind is completely focused on earthly things, on the world, that which is around them. They become desensitized to their sin because all they see around them is sin. They can't understand the goodness and the purity of the light of God. You get so used to living in this, in this dimmered light world that you don't understand the promise and the fullness of the promise. Yesterday, we went over to Dixie Caverns, uh, Andressa and I and Alyssa and her mom and Eleno. And at one point in the cavern, it's, it's amazing. They turn all the lights off inside the cavern and it is absolute darkness. You can't see anything. If you held your hand in front of your face, you, you can't see it. And then after about 15 seconds, they turn the light on. And you don't rejoice in the light. You squint in the light when it first comes on. It's an offense to your eyes, to your senses, because it is so bright. That's what Jesus is explaining. How gracious of God that he would make a physical representation of the spiritual presence of what he is when he enters this world. So as we look at John 8, 12, we see, once again, Jesus is professing that he is God. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me does not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. God is, once again, professing, I am. Ego am a. God, I am who I am. Then he says, I am the light of the world. This is the third proclamation of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that has drawn so much criticism. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And the Pharisees came after him. Jesus said, all who thirst come to me and drink and out of you will flow rivers of living water. And the Pharisees came after him. And now Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me does not walk in darkness, but walks in light. And the Pharisees are going to come after him. In three of these statements, Jesus says that I am bread, I am water, and I am light. I am the three elements that it takes to provide and sustain life. But on top of that, Jesus here talks about the Trinity of God. I am the bread of life that was given by the Father. Out of me, if you drink from me, out of you will flow rivers of living water. Out of me, from my provision will come the promised Holy Spirit that will flow out of you and not only give life and sustain life, but produce life. And on top of that, now Jesus says, I am the light of the world, the proclamation of the Son. This should be something that is embraced by man. This should be something that they look into their heart and they say, oh my goodness, the promised Messiah is here. Jesus had given sign after sign after sign that fulfilled scripture, that gave efficacy to his word, just as, as God had given Abraham sign after sign after sign to give efficacy to his word. But is it good enough for man? No. Now understand, as, as we see Jesus speaking to and calling out the Pharisees, this is out of love. He is speaking to them so that they too may be saved. Why? Ezekiel says, uh, God does not take pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. Paul writes that God desires all to be saved. All includes that Pharisee. One of the best quotes comes from a guy who doesn't have too good of a name anymore, and posthumously they found out some of his wrongdoings. But Robbie Zacharias 
one of his quotes was, was so powerful. He says that Jesus did not come to win the argument. He came to win the individual. God was pouring out grace on those Pharisees by speaking to him, regardless of the fact that he knew they would be the ones that would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself and your testimony is not true. Now understand what's happening here. Jesus is offering them life. He's offering them salvation. And they're gathering evidence to put him on trial. Now they are leaning into Jesus when he said in, in John 5, 13, if I alone bear testimony about myself, then my testimony is not true, of course. But more so, more so, Jesus understands what they're doing. They're quoting Deuteronomy 19, where it says, on the evidence of two or more witnesses, the charge may stand. Jesus doesn't have a defense. Then Jesus answers them. Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that your testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness with me. It is the prayer. It is the declaration of faith of every Jew as they come into worship in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And Jesus says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That one means God is unified. Father and Son walk in step with each other. At no time is Jesus going rogue. This is the promise, once again, we spoke shortly about it, I believe last week, where Moses, through God's exhortation, gave the promise that from among you a prophet will come and I will put my words in his mouth. Jesus is not speaking anything outside of the will of the Father. It is not the testimony of one. It is the testimony of two. Jesus says, I judge no one. In a few weeks, we're going to get into John 12, where Jesus gives fullness to the explanation of this. He says, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. What is the word that Jesus has spoken? Believe in me and you shall have eternal life. Why do we not believe that? Why would we call him into question for such a thing? Why would the Pharisees? In my experience, which is limited, but I've seen two types of people among the lost that reject Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Number one are people who do not believe that they deserve a relationship with God. I have fallen so far. I have done everything. You have no idea what I have done. But through the words in the confession of the Samaritan woman, she said, he has told me everything I have done. And he still desires to teach me, to show me, to lead me, to save me. So we know that their testimony is false. Then the other type of person, and we'll see this all the time. This is more common than not. If there is a God, if there is a heaven, I'm good enough. Oof, really? We see this time and time again. People will believe that, you know what? I go down to the soup kitchen and I dish out food every once in a while and I, I sign a check to Jerry's kids and, and yeah, you know, I, I do my part. I hold doors open for people. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever stolen anything? No, anything? Ah, there we go. Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Immediately, they will say, don't judge me. 
I'm, I'm not judging you. There's no need for judgment. I just want to tell you about the free gift of my Lord. No, you're judging me. No, I'm not better than you. It was, it was through his grace that I'm saved as well. Don't judge me. I'm fine the way I am. That's not the words of this book. Jesus did not come to leave you the way that you are. Jesus came so that you may be a new creation, not an improved Brian, something that never doesn't even resemble the original Brian, that you may walk in his light. That's the promise. But people reject the promise. Why? They like the darkness. They're used to the darkness. We see next the darkness that is in the Pharisees. They say to him, therefore, where is your father? Now, if you look contextually what's going on here, Joseph would be gone. They're looking at his earthly father. Number one, they are looking to show the vulnerability of Jesus. Jesus is now orphaned by his dad. And number two, they're looking to discredit the witness. The only witness he has is his father. Well, we know Joseph is dead. It would have been common knowledge. Jesus, you're on your own. But our Lord corrects them. You know neither me nor the father. If you knew me, you would know the Father also. Colossians 1.15, Paul says it best. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creations. As John spoke with Philip, Philip was begging him, show me the Father. Please, Jesus, show us the Father. What does Jesus say to him? Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The testimony of Jesus is true because he can swear by no greater name than his own. The name that is above all names. The name that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. There'll be some people that will do that and still choose to remain in the darkness. That even if the Lord himself came to the door and opened up the door of hell and said, come on this way, they would say, no, 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 shut that door. We want nothing to do with you. There are some. They love the darkness. The last verse of this gives so much efficacy to the words of our Lord, the words of the Father. It's not just context. Verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. That's the context. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. The promise of God is so exact, is so precise, that he will fulfill it in his exact moment, in his exact time, in his exact way, regardless of the darkness of this world regardless of the heart of man. God is sovereign over all. So you be the judge. In John 20, he makes it very clear he is writing all this so that you may believe in that by believing you may have life in his name. The life is the light of the world. He's come into this world. You be the judge. Do you choose light and life? Or do you embrace the darkness? Do you hold on to the darkness? Do you look at what your life is today and you say, God, regardless of your promise, regardless of even you swearing by your name, regardless of the unification of the will of the Father, Son, and Spirit, what I have here is more valuable to me than anything you can promise. It is more valuable to me than the peace that Jesus promises. There'll be many that say no. As I, as I throw this out and ask you to be the judge and, and you folks online as well, please understand I'm not trying to talk you into a worldwide organization. I'm not trying to talk you into joining a church or a denomination trying to talk you out of hell. 
the darkness that you've already experienced that will become magnified in eternity. That's not God. What God wants for you, it's not his plan for you. We all have a choice daily to judge for ourselves, like giving. Acceptance of Christ Jesus is not just an emotional reaction. That, that's a one-and-done thing. It is a daily taking up your cross and walking with him, walking in the light. That is the exhortation. But his promises, every promise in this book is true. There is no name greater, and he is worthy. He is worthy. I pray for each and every one of you and, and every name on the prayer list, not just for the physical needs that are being asked for, but for the spiritual needs of you and those around you, that they may desire the light and desire a relationship with him as much as he desires a relationship with you. Will you pray with me? Lord God, what a gift, Father, that you offer to us. That we could seek the light and find the light. That you're not a gift, that you're not a God that, that's far off, that looks to make us and judge us and stand. But there is an absolute law. There's no subjectivity to your law. There's no subjectivity to your word. There's a difference between righteousness and holiness and where we are in the darkness. Lord God, I pray that more and more of us will seek your light. And Lord God, show us how to pour out of us rivers of living water that we can be the conduit for your light that we could see it sprout up from around us, Lord God, trees that bear fruit in each season and leaves for the healing of the nations. Lord God, enable your spirit, embolden your spirit in us, that we can speak of the hope that is inside of us. I thank you for this time, God. I pray glory to your name. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.